Anyways, um, it's Mother's Day, and aren't we glad for our moms? I know I am. Um, without my mom's dedication and without her iron will to make sure that her kids would uh, go to Sunday school, um, that they'd go to church, um, and, and honestly, that they'd know Jesus, I, I would never be the person I am today. So, Mom, thank you. She's not here, but, but she'll be listening in uh, via the, the webcast uh, a little later. Um, so I wanted to definitely throw that shout out to my mom, you know. Uh, anyways, so my mom wanted us to know Jesus, wanted all of her kids to know Jesus. Um, and I'm sure some days were harder uh, than others. And parents, I'm sure you've experienced that too. Uh, my mom, for, for much of our lives, uh, uh, lived as a, as a single mom. So she had uh, quite a task. So it ended up being uh, my brothers and then me and then my sister going through confirmation, um, you know, each at their time. So my mom was pretty consistent. Um, as a matter of fact, I still have my old confirmation book. It's a, it's a Luther's catechism. Uh, Lutheran church is, is uh, just a close cousin to uh, the Methodist church, but I still have other stuff like the girls I liked in here and, and uh, you know, important stuff like what I was supposed to study and, you know, diagrams from the 70s and that sort of thing. So it's pretty cool, and I still have my, my gift uh, from my mom with the, with the date when I was uh, confirmed, May 1st, 1988, or Year of Our Lord, uh, 1988 for some of you folks. It's a little bit tattered and beat up, but it still does a job. Um, it, it, it was pretty cool. You see, back then, we had a church that was maybe a little bit bigger than our chapel. <laughs> I, I kid you not. Uh, maybe 150, 200, if you really wanted to squeeze it, people that, that went. And uh, uh, we had a, a young and inexperienced pastor. It was his first assignment. Um, and uh, uh, so he was charged with running pretty much every aspect of our little church. That included confirmation. And uh, so that year, uh, being his first year in ministry, he got baptized with fire because um, I was in his uh, confirmation class. <laughs> then, uh, needless to say, uh, I, yeah, I, I didn't like class, especially not confirmation class. And I was probably the most disruptive and rude kid that he had in there. Um, and I was, uh, I'm sure I was the worst student. Um, but uh, he did make me memorize uh, just a whole litany of things. Um, all the way through uh, Sunday school and culminating in, in confirmation. And uh, I remember that day. Um, he was uh, pastors back then. Some of them still do wear the long habit robe type deal. And he had the, I don't know, the holy scarf thing that went on him. And uh, uh, I remember taking a picture with him. And so I, I still have that blazoned in my mind even today. Unfortunately, after that point, I didn't get hooked up with a youth group. Um, for fellowship and, and accountability, um, or a youth pastor, for that matter, to answer any of my difficult life questions, um, kind of kept myself on that. And so I ended up drifting um, from what faith I thought I had until my graduation from high school. In other words, I was a Christian only on Sundays and at traffic stops, which came uh, you know, more frequently than I'd like to admit. Youth group, you see, youth group is a place where faith grows, and uh, more, often than not, more often than not, it's a place you find answers, and it's often a place to, as you heard the students say, to fan into flame um, the gifts you've received. As a matter of fact, that, that, little, uh, uh, that little phrase, fan into flame, if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, comes from the word anazopirin, which means uh, to make the fire alive again. Or, or to bring up the life of the fire. In other words, to stoke the fire you know, from underneath. And so the foundry, you know, our student ministries, um, is, is really the perfect place for that spot to happen for kids. Um, students have the opportunity to meet Jesus for the first time, be discipled, and, and really to develop their gifts, fanning that little spark into a huge blazing bonfire flame. Um, yeah, I like that picture. Um, in other words, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say in an old thousand foot crutch song, they say it best, um, I've got a bad case of turning it up. It's getting cold in here, so fire it up. Um, we want to fire up our students for Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to do what, uh, what movies do, you know, kind of flash back to me. Remember we started talking about me, and, and so we're going to kind of flash back to me. And uh, so here I am, I'm in high school, and if I had any fire at all, it, it was only a spark, and it was only on Sundays when I, when I had to, you know, exhibit it. 
Um, but just three months short, uh, three months uh, after graduation, I went through a stop sign on my way to work. Um, and I hit a car, killing the man inside that was driving it. He was 69 years old. His name was, uh, I don't know if I can say, his name was Theodore Pixley. He was uh, an avid Christian, a strong Christian man um, that carried a, a case full of Bibles in his back seat to give away. He was active in the local uh, rescue mission in the homeless center and, uh, and also in his church, which happened uh, to be later on, uh, it became my church. And so, you know, this happened all at once. And uh, here I was, and all this stuff that I learned, you know, a few years back, uh, it came rolling into my mind. And I wanted to know what happened to the man. You know, I wanted to know what would happen to me, uh, both in life and when I died. I just, I just killed a guy, and he was an avid Christian. He was an avid, uh, he, he loved the Lord, and it showed. Me, I was a Sunday Christian. I said I was a Christian, but really I wasn't. So I didn't know what was going to happen to me, and, and it just really, really made me uh, focus in uh, on, uh, on my life and on what God's word was going to say to me. And I remembered God's forgiveness from a passage in Confirmation. It's 1 John 1, 7. I remember the second part first. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. I knew that if I asked God, he'd forgive me. But the feeling of guilt was still there. Not only for the car accident and, and, and going through the stop sign, but also for the way I'd been living. The way I'd been living life, saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but not really being one, I guess. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was tough for an 18-year-old, I'll say the least. But then I remembered the, uh, the first part of 1 John 1, 7, and that said, if we say that we have fellowship with him, that's Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie, and we don't do the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You see, I wasn't walking in that light. I might have been going to church, getting confirmed, even a member. But I didn't have fellowship with God. My life was full of darkness, envy, lust, greed, selfishness. I was walking around as if I was blind for what, to what God expected of Christians. <clears throat> and and I, was, I was blind to what he wanted to do with my life. And when it comes down to it, I really didn't believe. I didn't believe, at least not in a way that, that makes any kind of difference. But the knowledge of scripture that I gained in Sunday school, even though, you know, she had, my mom had to drive me in there kicking and screaming sometimes, and confirmation, along with a little tract I had received as I visited a storefront church, all those things spelled out the truth that I was taught, but never really put any stock in. That was that I'm a, I was a sinner. That I'm a sinner saved by grace. And so is everybody else. Everybody, there's none of us in this room that are perfect. That I had no hope of eternal life on my own, no hope of forgiveness, just eternity in hell, a real place. That God sent his son to pay for my sin, for what I did. He died on the cross for what I did. And that by believing in Jesus Christ and confessing that, I would have eternal life. So when I was 18 years old, at 2 a.m. On a, on a summer night, up in my upstairs bedroom, you know, I got down, got down on my knees and, and uh, uh, I recalled all these things that, that God had taught me over the years. And uh, I read over that tract again called Romans Roadmap to Heaven. And um, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to be my Savior and to, to be my Lord. And that night, I was born from above. That night, as Jesus told Nicodemus, I was born again. I was saved. Whatever we want to call it. Committed my life to Christ. Um, made a commitment. God transformed me. And... You see, God had been working on me for quite some time. I just didn't realize it. We never do. And it was him that brought me to, the, that brought me to salvation. Some refer to it as God's sovereignty. Some refer to it as God's provenient grace. I don't care what it's called. 
I'm just glad it happened to me, and I'm glad that he saved me. Looking back, I can see that God used my mom in some pretty instrumental ways in my life. She was a, a significant pillar as I was growing up. So parents, I don't want you to lose hope um, if you feel like you're struggling with your, your kids right now. And grandparents, I don't want you to lose hope either, whether it's your kids or your grandkids, that, that God can and will make a difference. So you, you, you just have to hang in there and trust him. Um, and it seemed like God kind of did things in an order um, of priorities through my, through my life. Um, and through my mom, and I'd like to share that real quickly with you. Um, it's what I like to call mom's three S's. Um, some guys refer to the three S's as, as uh, something else if you were in the military, um, but never mind. Um, <laughs> anyways, priority number one is our Savior, the Savior. We're going to look at uh, 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verses uh, 15, 16, and 17. If you want to put your thumb there or finger there in the Bible and follow along, or you can look up here. The first, it says, From childhood you've been acquainted with Holy Scripture, or the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The first thing is to introduce and expect. To introduce and expect um, that, that Jesus will change your kids. You see, Eunice, that's, that's uh, Timothy's mom, um, Timothy was the, was the guy who this letter was written to from Paul. Eunice led her boy to, to know Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. She taught him about Jesus and expected that he would accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so when a mother anticipates and prays and leads towards Christ, she has every right to expect that God is going to um, bring her child um, to salvation to him. And it sounds simple and maybe easy but it's not simple or easy, and it certainly isn't cheap. Susanna Wesley, um, who is the mother of John and Charles Wesley, um, is said to have prayed one hour every day for her children. She was strict, but she was unselfishly faithful, which leads us to our, our second priority, uh, Scripture. As we look again, we see the second half of this. All Scripture is breathed out by God. When I, when I say breathed out, um, some uh, older versions say inspired. The word inspired there means literally breathed out. So all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, correct, for correction, and training in righteousness. So we teach them young. Eunice taught her son the scriptures starting at a very early age. Jewish boys started formal instruction in the scriptures when they were, at age, when they were age five. That's, that seems pretty early to us, but it's not. Start them as soon as they can talk. It said that Susanna Wesley had 19 children. Whew, you think you got it bad. <laughs> Jeez, 19 kids, man. That's a, that's a youth group right there. <laughs> wow. What's more is this mom of Charles and John Wesley. If you don't know who Charles and John Wesley are, Charles Wesley wrote three quarters of the hymns and the songs that we sing today. And John Wesley was the, the, the founder of, of this movement called Methodism that turned into these churches that we have today. Um, What's more is that she took, a, she set every child aside, or she took a, um, an hour and, and, and set every uh, child aside and spoke with them and, and taught them from God's word. And those two sons, John and Charles, they touched two continents for Christ, two. So, I mean, parents, grandparents, nobody is going to make you do this. As a matter of fact, the world is telling you the exact, exact opposite. Give your kids to us. We want, we want them to spend their money. We want them to turn out just like us. I don't think you want that. You see, nobody's going to teach your kids about Jesus Christ for you. It's got to be you. Nobody's going to teach them unless it's you. You guys, whether you know it or not, I'm a helper. You're the foremost spiritual authority in your child's life, whether you know it or not. So if you make God's word a top priority in your life and attempt to live out um, you know, what, what you believe in front of your children and be ready to answer their questions, you will be teaching them. On the other hand, if you decide not to live it out, then you should, probably shouldn't be teaching them anyways because they're going to pick up on uh, your actions more than, they do, more than they do your words. You guys have heard that statement. Um, 
don't do what I do, do what I say, or do what I say, not what I do. Yeah, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Kids will follow your behavior. So when, when it comes down to it, Scripture is, is of the utmost importance. So number one, we got salvation. We got a Savior. Number two, we got Scripture. Teach them while they're young. Teach them all the time. And number three, as we come to the last one, is service. As we continue to look at these scriptures, we see up here, 317, that the man of God may be, may be complete, equipped for every good work. That is, the man of God or the woman of God. In my mom's case, it was the woman of God. Until my dad came along and, and you know, they got back together and then it was my, my dad and mom and, well, you get the idea. You see, all of Timothy's instruction in God's word and God's way really led up to that, to, to serving the Lord. I mean, Timothy's good reputation had its start in his grandmother. And really the best legacy that we can leave our kids isn't a pile of money or possessions, but a relationship with Jesus Christ and the simple fact of a good name. See, Eunice's reputation replicated itself in Timothy. Eunice served, Timothy followed and served. You see, there's been tons of faithful servants of God that have the same testimony. In closing, I'd like to read you a quote from a, a, an old pastor, um, preacher G. Campbell Morgan. He had four sons. They all became preachers. At a family reunion, a friend asked one of the sons, which Morgan is the greatest preacher? With his eyes beaming with delight, the son looked over to his father and said, why, it's mother. Which I thought was kind of funny. You see, we all have a, a, a part to play in this, especially moms. That's why each of us have a special place for our mother. And so today is, is being Mother's Day. Um, this, this is especially for moms, but it's also for the rest of us. My, my question is this. Are you preparing your children with Scripture? Learned by you both at church and practice at home? Or are you just letting the culture teach your children? What are your kids going to say when the world, when peer pressure, and when, when culture challenge them, they challenge their faith? Will they be able to stand up against the tide? You see, there's, there's two emotions, at least two emotions when you have kids. The first one is, whoa, I just had a kid. I'm really excited. And it's like, oh, whoa, now what? Yeah. At least that's the way it was for me. You know, you see this kid pop out and he looks like you and you don't know what to do. Or when they puke on your back when they're swinging. Anyway, that's just personal memories. Here's what I have to say to you is, uh, is what they talked about. Psalm 119.9. Hide the, hide the words of the Lord in your heart. Continue in that. Walk in, walk in the ways that he, that he showed you. And also in 2 Timothy 3.14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom, whom you've learned it. So remember the three S's this morning. Savior, Scripture, and salvation. That's not a method. It's not a, a formula. It's just an easy way to, to remember how to live out the Christian faith. I'll end with a Spanish proverb that Andrew stole from me uh, earlier this week. <laughs> That's okay. I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> An ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>